Ringrazio naturalmente per l'invito, è un piacere, mh, al di là della retorica, eh, essere qui per fare questa lezione voltiana. Vedo tante persone che, che conosco e ringrazio naturalmente per questa presentazione che ha, fatto, che ha fatto Michele. Io vi parlerò appunto in inglese della, delle onde gravitazionali. So I will switch in English just to, um, to tell you about this... Uh, the opening of this new astronomical window, the gravitational wave window. Uh, let me start uh, by reminding you what happened on the Earth on September 14, 2015. That day we received and measured the first gravitational waves coming from a very peculiar source in the sky. The, the, you know, <coughs> the waveform, the shape of a wave, brings a lot of information. Suppose you enter in a dark room and you don't know what, what there is there. You don't see nothing. At a certain moment, someone plays a, a note in, in a piano. Then, immediately, you recognize that in that room there is a piano and even which note has been played and if you are uh, quite uh, expert you even can distinguish if the piano is good one or if it's economic uh, cheap that, let's say so the shape of a wave brings a lot of information so it is not a surprise that this wave told us many things on the source on the instrument if you want that to wear in in the sky and uh, this was the instrument, this was the, the source uh, of, of this wave. We knew that there, are, there were two very large mass objects, 36 solar mass one, 29 solar mass the other, that were very compact, very small, only 100 kilometers of diameter, so two very concentrated mass, incredibly. We know all that, and we will see better in the, the rest of the talk, why, how it is possible to know all this. But it's um, more or less the same, that uh, surpri a surprise like uh, knowing that there is a piano and there is a note in a dark room. So what, uh, uh, the, what we can reconstruct about the source uh, is this. There were these two black holes which were rotating one around the other and uh, this is quite slower than the original I mean the original was much faster but th this is to appreciate uh, this dance uh, of one black hole respect to the other and at the end of this dance uh, they fuse each other all these generated gravitational waves uh, arriving on the earth uh, on 2015, but generated uh, there in, the, in that point in the sky one billion, more than one billion years ago. You see that uh, you see that you don't see because uh, no photons came from this source, no electromagnetic wave. So we know about this source only through gravitational waves. But what is gravitational waves? Well, uh, let me start, uh, uh, since this is, this is a lecture, and uh, I think we have, uh, well, not one hour, a little bit less, but let's say we have some time to develop uh, and to appreciate uh, how uh, human beings arrived to these uh, uh, nice results, fundamental results. Um, this is the notebook uh, of an Italian, of Galileo Galilei, which was reporting on a certain day the, uh, a surprise, I mean, a, a new discovery. Now, I like to show this because I consider this date, uh, 7 January 1610, the beginning of the modern astronomy. Uh, up, up to that moment, uh, astronomy were made uh, by naked eye. So, you knew about uh, the universe, uh, not only by, by the light, but the, the nearest light, let's say. 
so in, in particular you knew that uh, uh, there was a Jupiter, uh, a very important uh, planet there. But what, but what uh, uh, Galileo discovered, uh, mm, pointing the, the telescope, uh, the cannon as we, he called him, to the sky was uh, a surprise, was something new. When you develop a new instrument, uh, you always have uh, something new, and most of the time this was not predicted. In fact, this was not predicted. What, what is all? Let, let us uh, read in Italian that at the 7, 7 di gennaio 1910, Giove si vedeva col cannone, che è appunto il nome che si dà al cannocchiale, e tre stelle fisse così. So three fixed stars, one, two and three. This is I, see the director of Jupiter. So, and he says, delle quali senza il cannone niuna si vedeva. So it was a discovery. Three lights that were not reported by Babylonians, uh, by Egyptians, by Greeks, uh, by the Bible. No, n nothing. It was the discovery of the ignorance. And what it is the beginning of the modern astronomy because, uh, uh, um, because it was, uh, was uh, not only a surprise, but uh, even more, after that, uh, he says, a D8, so the day after, appariva così. This is Jupiter, and the three stars moved. This is, was even more incredible. Not only there were new, new stars in the sky near Jupiter, but the stars moved with respect to Jupiter. This was absolutely incredible. And then he also says that uh, the, mo the motion is in, in the opposite direction respect to, the, to, to what uh, the calculator says. In modo diretto e non retrogrado, come dicono i calculatori. I calculatori were the people calculating the position of the, uh, uh, the, the, these objects in the sky. A D9 era nugolo, punto. The day after was cloudy. But he says that. Uh, you see, it is important to report. Uh, this is uh, <coughs> something very simple, but it is important to understand that uh, discoveries are made by a scrupulous uh, uh, reporting of what you see, what happens. Uh, even if uh, it was cloudy, he could have not written that it was cloudy, okay. No, he, he said that the day 10, we know that uh, near Padova in, uh, 19, in 1610, the day of uh, 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 9 of January was cloudy. Uh, 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 and, and then the day after, uh, the day 10, you see there was uh, uh, again, they moved and one of the stars was in front of Jupiter. So it was uh, the incredible discovery that, there was, uh, that Jupiter was uh, a solar system in its own, a small solar system in its own. Why this was incredible? Because uh, the uh, Copernica, Copernican revolution was very, very recent. So the Sun, following Copernicus, uh, had this special privileged role to be the center of a local universe, uh, everything around the sun, not around the earth. Uh, and this is, was already a revolution, of course. But this is another revolution because uh, Jupiter in its own has this, this, uh, um, this privilege in self. Uh, this is the first sign of the universality of gravitation. And uh, in my opinion, from this point on in the history, nothing was like before. It was the, the beginning of a long, uh, of a long uh, uh, trip. Then came Newton and gave uh, to this observation a mathematical form. I mean, with Newton we understand uh, universal gravitation. We understand even mat oh, mathematically. And uh, this is a drawing uh, like before it was the original manuscript of Galileo. This is an original drawing of uh, Newton. And uh, in this drawing there is uh, a fantastic synthesis of the heaven and on the earth. Uh, up to the time, the, mm, our mentality, I mean, the way of looking to the universe was that on the earth uh, there were some phenomena, terrestrial phenomena, dirty phenomena, and in the sky there were the pure heaven uh, phenomena. So different nature. With this drawing, we understand 
that there are, there are not two physics, there are not two, nat two different nature. This all is all only one physics in all the universe. And this is why, because he says simply that if you throw a stone from the top of a mountain, the stone, of course, falls on the earth. This is a common experience. If you throw with a higher speed, then it falls a little bit farther. Uh, if you throw with them um, uh, stronger, let's say, it will uh, fall a, lot, uh, a little bit farther again. And if you fall a little bit more, then it continues to fall forever. It continues to fall forever without meeting the Earth, because the Earth has uh, some finite dimension, of course. But w why this is revolutionary in itself? Because he understands that the Moon is falling on the Earth. This is why the Moon is there. Why the Moon is always there, near the Earth, but not, I mean, not going away. Simply with the same law that attracts uh, stones on the Earth, uh, that makes our has uh, uh, being uh, fixed uh, here on the Earth. Uh, it's the same, the, same the same solution, I mean, uh, the same reason. So the reason <coughs> was uh, then uh, written mathematically in, uh, through the gravitational force, uh, in which, as you know very well, the product of the masses uh, divided by the square of the distance uh, between the two masses. And uh, with the, this mathematical form, we know why the solar system is there. I mean, we can predict uh, where a certain planet will be in uh, 1,000 years. This works uh, very well, works very well in Newtonian mechanics. It was uh, really uh, a step, a fundamental step uh, in the history of, uh, of philosophy, of natural philosophy, of physics, not only of science. Then arrived uh, another man, which uh, said uh, that uh, actually uh, the force of gravity does not exist, really. So this is uh, even more surprising, and uh, we, you need to, to explain why. First of all, why Einstein thought uh, that uh, Newton was wrong? Um, he thought that because the Newtonian mechanics uh, and the Newtonian gravity had a problem. The problem is that uh, gravity was fixed uh, to the source. If the sun moves, uh, all the gravitational field moves uh, with the sun, propagating the information that he is moving at the speed uh, infinite, infinite speed. So the field, gravitational field, uh, is in a sort of prisoner of the source. There is, not, there is no way. I mean, just, uh, just everything is, uh, it knows immediately that what, what, what the movement uh, in, uh, in the sky. This was not uh, in, uh, in the uh, following Einstein, this was not uh, reasonable <laughs> in a way. Uh, he, he knows uh, uh, at that time already that uh, the Coulomb force has the same expression of uh, the Newtonian uh, force, uh, but uh, with the electromagnetic field, what happens if uh, this electric charge moves, uh, then a wave propagates and the electromagnetic field propagates at a certain speed, the speed of light, uh, which is extremely large, but not infinite. So the fact that the gravity had this infinite speed of propagation was, was not, uh, was not, I mean, uh, uh, it's not symmetric with respect to the, to the electromagnetic case. And then also other, other, other reason, but uh, let me in this uh, lecture go to the, to the heart of the, of the various issues. So uh, following Newton, the, the, the explanation for the gravitational attraction is not the presence of a force, it's that the presence of the masses uh, Deformates, uh, uh, deformates the space-time around, and this deformation causes uh, all the other masses, uh, the planets, uh, to go free, but uh, constrained by the curvature of the space-time. So, in a way, the presence of the Sun uh, makes uh, the space-time no more flat. What does it mean, flat? Uh, that following Newton, this is a mass, uh, 
attracts everything. But if, he, if a ray of light passes here, it goes straight. And if a ray of light passes there, it goes straight. The space-time is flat. You, you, go, you can give two laser light uh, parallel and they go parallel forever. Well, following Newton, this was not right. I mean, the, the, the presence of a mass uh, deformates uh, the space-time around and uh, the, if you put uh, a, a small mass here, it goes around this one, not because of the presence of a force, uh, but because of the deformation of, of the space-time around. In, uh, in a very synthetic way, as John Archibald Wheeler said, space tells matter how to move, matter tells space time how to curve. This is the equation of Einstein in a, in a very compact form and it's quite uh, difficult to understand. But let me make a simple comparison just to, to understand what we are speaking of. The comparison which I made is uh, mm, this equation with uh, another equation, which the, all the students should know, I think, it's much more simple, is the equation of a spring and a mass. If you apply a force uh, and uh, this mass is connected uh, with a spring of a certain lasting constant, uh, k, which it said you how stiff uh, is the spring, then there will be a deformation, x, uh, which will depend uh, on the force applied and on the elastic constant. So this is the expression of the force, it reacts, uh, the, the system reacts with the force in the opposite direction respect to the one of the force applied and uh, so the comparison is that the force has the same role here of this, this is the tensor, the energy tensor, let's say, this mass energy tensor here, so it's the uh, the, the cause, the, 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 the source uh, of the deformation, and this is the deformation. So, in, uh, in, the, in the Einstein equation, the, the um, metric tensor, let's say, the, the what gives you the geometry of space-time, depends on the presence uh, of energy and masses all around. So, the force here is like uh, this tensor there, the x uh, is the deformation, so it plays the same role of the metric tensor here. And k, which is the lasting constant, which say you how stiff uh, is the spring, uh, it is equivalent to this constant here, which say you how stiff is space-time. And what happens is that space-time is very stiff, uh, is the stiffest thing in nature, if you want. Uh, and this is because c is, a, a b is big, g is a small number, so the elastic constant of the space-time is, uh, is incredibly high. It's very difficult uh, to deform space-time. I cannot deform space-time with an object like that. I have to deform space-time with a very big mass, like the Sun. And how I see the effect of this deformation? The Earth goes around. This is the effect. The, the Earth goes free. No force, just uh, it follows uh, what is the, uh, the minimum distance uh, in the space-time de which is deformed by the presence of the Sun. And this was demonstrated in a wonderful experiment by Arthur Eddington in 1919. So this is the position of a star, this ray of light uh, will go straight uh, following Newton. But following Einstein, the presence of the Sun gives uh, a, a certain curvature to space-time, and so from the Earth, uh, the, real, the apparent position of the star is, is there, it's no more here. So what Eddington mm, did was to had an expedition in an island in the Atlantic Ocean in 1919, where a, a total eclipse uh, uh, had, had was predicted, uh, was predicted, was, uh, was, uh, and uh, the presence of the star around the sun, when the, the moon was on the sun, of course it was possible to see the star around, was in a different position, they were m in a different place respect to the position they had without the sun in this position there. So it demonstrated that actually Einstein is right. 
and that uh, every mass, uh, every presence of a mass uh, or a star in the sky or even a planet deforms space-time. So uh, for a sun the deformation is relatively small, sufficient to, to see the planets around him. But we can think of objects uh, which are more dense and then this uh, uh, gives uh, a deformation to space-time which is more pronounced. Uh, you can think of uh, white dwarf, uh, neutron stars or black holes, uh, which are the object uh, that uh, have, uh, that also are the, the more strong gravitational wave sources. And for each of these uh, of these objects, uh, you can you think you can think about of of, uh, of a certain deformation in space time. Now, the black hole is uh, the extreme object in which the gravity on the surface is so strong that not even a photon can go out. Uh, a black hole uh, following the Einstein equation is different for, from a black hole uh, in Newtonian mechanics. You can say black hole in Newtonian mechanics. Following Newton, you can imagine to have a black hole, of course. In fact, uh, the Reverend Mitchell in 1783, with only Newtonian mechanics, it was a very, very simple calculation that it is possible that a mass, if it is concentrated, may have uh, a, a, a surface gravity so strong that not even light can escape. This is because uh, every object, uh, every planet, uh, ha every star has an escape velocity. And this is, this is clear. If we want uh, this object uh, goes away from the Earth, uh, not returning anymore, I have to give to this object uh, a, a cinetic energy much uh, greater than the potential energy of attraction that the Earth uh, has on this object. So it is very simple to show that if you follow here, the, the m is the small mass uh, that, uh, that wants to escape from the planet, uh, then if uh, the kinetic energy is larger than the, the potential energy, m escapes. But not even the light can escape if uh, you have uh, that the escape velocity is the one of, of the light. So the object M, which is uh, squeezed inside a certain limit radius, uh, will appear completely dark. And the condition following Newtonian mechanics uh, to have uh, a, a dark star called uh, John Mitchell, then uh, Archibald Weirer said uh, a black hole, but it is the same object, you see, every, every, for every mass, uh, you can imagine uh, a certain radius, uh, the Schwarzschild radius, called uh, then after, after Einstein, which uh, it means that uh, uh, if, the, if you want the Earth to be a black hole, then you have to squeeze the Earth in uh, as a, a small sphere of one centimeter diameter. If you want the star, a mass like the star, become a black hole, you have to squeeze that in a three kilometer size uh, sphere. It's very difficult to have a black hole, of course. It's not simple at all. Following Einstein, there is a difference that uh, a black hole is not simply an object which is compact enough uh, uh, and uh, able to not escape uh, even the light. Following Einstein, when a mass uh, collapsing uh, arrives uh, to this limiting radius, it goes straight to the center, to the point at the center. This is an infinite uh, curvature right at the center of uh, this object. So a black hole following general relativity is not a black hole following ne Newtonian gravity. A black hole following general relativity is uh, a big, uh, big, relatively big, is a, a bubble, black bubble, empty inside. All the mass is concentrated at the origin. If you, if you pass the limit uh, of this uh, radius, uh, the event horizon, then space and time reverse each other and you cannot stop. You go directly to the center. Now this is uh, something which gives to the, to the black hole uh, um, a very fascinating uh, nature, of course. Uh, 
and uh, this is uh, what uh, uh, what happens uh, what we thought uh, happened uh, in in uh, in the sky so i said uh, it's difficult to squeeze an object uh, certainly artificially is uh, say is impossible to squeeze an object but uh, nature in the universe uh, may squeeze uh, masses uh, and realize uh, these compact objects that uh, was uh, imagined uh, for instance uh, if the star is uh, an average star, then it passes various uh, uh, steps in the cycle, becoming a very compact object, but not a black hole, a dying star, something which is simply something which uh, fades with time and becoming uh, very concentrated. If the, the star is uh, massive, uh, um, um, massive says uh, 10 solar masses, uh, for instance, uh, then at the end of its life, uh, it collapses uh, and uh, the mass uh, may be so big uh, that uh, the, squeeze, uh, the, the squeezing force uh, can realize uh, a black hole, can go beyond this, uh, this event horizon limit uh, and form really a black hole or a neutron star. Now, I have no time to, to go further on that, otherwise I will employ all my time, but is uh, incredible to, to see that uh, a star uh, lives uh, for billions of years in a sort of equilibrium between two opposite uh, tendencies. Uh, one is the gravity, which makes the co more sa oh, compact and compact. And the other is uh, the nuclear reaction in the interior, which gives uh, radiation coming out uh, and uh, er, the radiation which tend to expand the star. So you have to these two opposite uh, tendencies. During its life, uh, during this life, the star forms uh, from hydrogen all the other elements. Uh, arriving to the iron, it stops. This fabric of elements, uh, this fabric of the periodic table of elements, uh, it stops uh, and at that moment, uh, without any more the radiation coming out, uh, the gravity wins and the object collapses, uh, collapses, implodes, uh, bounces, uh, and makes uh, all around, uh, uh, going uh, all around, all the elements formed. So carbon, oxygen, hydrogen, uh, ourselves, like we are made like all the planetary system of stars exploded somewhere here in, the, in this part of the universe. What remains uh, from the collapse may be a star is made of neutrons, because uh, electrons fall on the nucleus, uh, neutralize protons, so there is a big nucleus, uh, solar mass uh, nucleus, uh, or if the star is, is uh, bigger, it can form what is uh, what I call uh, the, a black hole. So this is uh, the revolutionary way of Einstein to see, uh, to see, to see gravity. And uh, uh, the year after his uh, general relativity theory, he uh, solved his equation with a simple approximation, which is called the weak field approximation, in which uh, he imagined the space-time to be almost flat. I mean, there is uh, only perturbation, which is in modulus much less than one. So this is uh, a almost flat space-time. Then, if you have this weak field approximation, the Einstein equations uh, uh, simplifies a lot, and uh, are the Einstein equation takes the form of a known equation in physics, the D'Alembert equation, which is the high solutions of waves, waves propagating in space at the speed of light. So a gravitational wave is a perturbation of the metric uh, traveling at the speed of light. Uh, there are uh, some main features uh, which are, they have two transversal polar ejection states, uh, they are associated with massless spin, two particles which are gravitons. Uh, these are different from the photons and from the electromagnetic uh, case. Uh, in electromagnetism, uh, it exists, there exist two types of charges, uh, plus and minus. Uh, and uh, in gravity, there is only one type of charge is only attracting. This makes uh, 
some difference, uh, and the difference is uh, in uh, the spin two particles and in the shape of the of the uh, polarization that you can expect. Uh, and I will see, I will show you in a moment. Another interesting fact uh, connected to this, uh, what, with what I said, uh, is that uh, a source uh, uh, which uh, has, uh, which lose energy because uh, of emitting, uh, of emitting radiation, has no the dipole term, which is the first non-null term in case of electromagnetic, uh, the electromagnetic case. Uh, if you expand uh, the the energy lost by a system, the first term, the dipole, is zero in the case of gravity, and this is connected to the fact that uh, the mm, linear momentum is conserved. And then there is not possible that exists a, 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 a dipole term in this radiation. So the first non-null term is the quadrupole one. This means that the source has to do something like that. I mean, it is a tidal shape that it, it's, it, uh, it, it is important. So the, the amplitude of the wave depends on the quadrupole of uh, the source. And uh, you see here the difference uh, the different the, the comparison between polarization in the electromagnetic waves uh, and polarization in the gravitational case. So see, gravity makes uh, this uh, tidal movement uh, while propagating in, in space. This is the original paper of Einstein predicting gravitational waves uh, in which he calculates uh, the amplitude, the possible amplitude of these waves. And he says, uh, I don't know how many of you uh, know German, I don't know German, so I mean I, tra I translated in English. He says, in any case, one can think of A, the amplitude, will have a practically vanishing value. Einstein understands that space-time is very stiff and that it is very difficult uh, to have uh, a large amplitude wave propagating in, 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 in space-time. So, uh, gravitational waves uh, was considered a curiosity, but not, not really something that you can detect, that you can try to, to, to see. Uh, and even in the 50s, there was a debate uh, raging are gravitational waves uh, real? It is a real, a true physical effect that we can measure, or, or uh, it is a coordinate effect that you can uh, put to zero with the change of coordinates. Now, it is incredible to see that Einstein itself uh, was, uh, uh, was, uh, was in the field of the people thinking that gravitational waves war was not really something which you can measure. It is interesting, this point. But uh, in 1956-57, this is, was the beginning, if you want, of the, of the experimental uh, detection of gravitational waves, because at that time, this was, there was not in 1957, there was no discussion of black holes and neutron stars. These were objects were, uh, were, were not known uh, in, uh, at that time, but uh, the, what the debate was if gravitational waves were real and if uh, they could be measured. So Felix Pirani points uh, a transparent connection between uh, the equation of geodesic deviation and the Newton's law and identified the curvature with the Newtonian potential. So this was the clear moment uh, in the history of the detection, because at that point it was clear that uh, if a gravitational waves arrive uh, in a system in which there are two points, these two points moves one respect to the other, and if you have a ray of light going back and forth, uh, then the, ti the time taken by this rate of light uh, will be larger or smaller, depending on the amplitude of the gravitational wave. This was the K point, uh, I mean, uh, in the history of, uh, of gravitational waves. And uh, immediately, um, some people, like Joe Weber, thought uh, a possibility of detecting, how you can detect. For instance, uh, with a laser interferometer, in which you can measure the distance between mirrors, 
using the, the light, or with the, some uh, sort of spring uh, with two masses, an oscillator, a diapason, we would say, that the gravitational waves was uh, put in vibration, more or less lies, uh, like a hammer, like a, a driving force, a driving term in an equation of harmonic oscillator. In both cases, uh, gravitational waves could be measured. This was the and the, the effect on a test student, we have here many students, uh, will be that uh, passing a gravitational wave passing through a student will have this effect, uh, in, uh, which is not so evident, of course. Uh, and this is why it took uh, 50 years of experimental efforts uh, to detect gravitational waves. So I, let, let me go directly to the, to the, to the heart uh, of, uh, of, the, of, the, of the lecture. And, uh, to try to understand uh, what are the objectives of gravitational detection. First of all, we have uh, to test uh, the Einstein prediction of the existence of gravitational waves. Then the second is that through this probe, uh, two gravitational waves, thanks to gravitational waves, we could understand the sources. Are there existing black holes, neutron stars, and all these fantastic objects or not? Then, cosmology. Also, this is very important, because you see, when you think on the history of the universe, you have to understand that uh, every messenger decoupled uh, from the primordial plasma in different epoch, for instance, photons uh, decoupled uh, at uh, when the universe was already 380,000 years after the Big Bang. This is the cosmic microwave background. Uh, neutrino, Neutrinos are uh, decoupled uh, after one minute, more or less, of the Big Bang. But uh, gravitons decoupled immediately after the Big Bang, 10 to the minus 43 seconds. So this, to, uh, to if we are able to detect uh, a background in gravitational waves, we have, uh, we have uh, uh, mm, an approach to the, to, to really to the Big Bang. This is, will be very difficult, and we are not ready to, to, to detect uh, this background. So we have uh, focused the attention of the data analysis uh, to the astrophysical sources. Astrophysical sources like, uh, well, everything uh, which uh, accelerates uh, and has a quadruple moment uh, will uh, generate gravitational waves. For instance, uh, in a supernova, a supernova, which is the explosion of the star, then in a millisecond scale time, there will be a, a sort of burst, uh, an impulse, uh, millisecond duration, which will propagate uh, giving this information. Uh, a spinning neutron star, so if a neutron star forms and it rotates, uh, rotates because uh, angular momentum tends to be conserved, of course. So if a star rotates slowly, but when it is compressed and squeezed, it rotates much faster. This is something which all we have experienced in a rotating seat, for instance, by, by um, moving, uh, moving uh, weights uh, uh, near to the body or far to the body. And in this case, the wave is uh, a sinusoidal uh, shape which is uh, modulated by the movement of the source and the detector. This is the source uh, which is uh, the best known, what people like more, because it is, a, it is a very clear analytical waveform in which two compact objects uh, spiral together. They emit gravitational waves, so they lose energy, they go near and nearer, they acquire, because of the conservation of the angular momentum, they go faster and faster, and at the end they merge. So this gives rise to a waveform, which we call chirp, which is something which increases in frequency and amplitude. And this shape tells us the masses of the two objects. And the amplitude at the moment of the merger tells us the distance of the source. Once you know the masses, uh, then the amplitude uh, at the end depends only where is the source, if it is near or it is far. So it's a measure 
of the distance of the source and this was it is very important because in that in that uh, mm, with that with that method we could determine Hubble constant independently from the other measurements in fact if you know which is the galaxy in which the source is <coughs> then you know the redshift of the galaxy, you know the distance of this galaxy because of the gravitational wave amplitude, then you know, you know the Hubble constant. And uh, at the end, this is stochastic background I, I told you already. So this is the man starting this research uh, in the US. Uh, he's uh, the dreamer, really. Um, he was not the only one, as in the in imagine in the song. In the song. He was a dreamer, but he's not the only one. In fact, uh, during the 60s, uh, in Italy, Amaldi tried to push the Italian physicists in the direction of researchers uh, at well, in the birth phase. One is the stochastic background, the infrared background radiation, and the other is uh, Penzias and Wilson, and the other was uh, gravitational waves. And in Italy, the, these two activities started uh, almost simultaneously at that time. Uh, in Rome, uh, Amaldi um, has an assistant, Guido Pizzella, and he became the leader of, uh, of, of the group. Thus, this uh, in Italy uh, was always uh, in the first row in this research. Uh, this is a picture which I like. This is Eduardo Amaldi when he was 80 years old. Uh, so we developed uh, this uh, resonant uh, masses, uh, the resonant, this diapason, that have to resonate one, uh, one, uh, when a gravitational waves arrived. Um, this is, uh, for instance, the explorer at CERN. All these three people, myself, Fulvio Ricci, Piero Rapagnani, we are now Virgo and Virgo, Alaigo Virgo collaboration. Because you see, when you um, start uh, knowing experimental methods uh, for putting a mass isolated from all the rest uh, and trying to measure his position, then this kind of uh, skill is the same for all the gravitation experiments. Italy is very, uh, if, uh, when I say it was always in the first row, uh, all the field is coordinated by Gravitational Wave International Committee and uh, mm, these are the chairs of the Gravitational Wave International Committee during the years. The first was Barry Barish, which is now Nobel Prize. The second was uh, uh, Massimo Cerdonio, Italian. The third was Jim Moff, and then uh, was uh, my turn. Uh, uh, two Italians uh, in, uh, in, in five, because now Sheila Rowan, uh, which is uh, Scottish, uh, Scots, uh, she, the new chair. Another um, demonstration, if you want, of the position of Italy, it that's the, the most important conference, the reference conference in this field is named after Eduardo Maldi. Well, let me try to show you which is the detector with which we detect the gravitational waves. So I start the final part of my conference looking, showing some, uh, some uh, uh, animation. So this is a, a laser interferometer. So how it works? Uh, it is quite simple. This is uh, a, a, sch a schematic uh, layout, of course. So this is the laser. This is a beam splitter. So the same beam goes in two perpendicular directions. It is uh, uh, reflected by the end mirrors. And so it is recomposed here. So what goes uh, to the photodetector in this case is zero, because you see, you have uh, regulated the distance in such a way to have opposite uh, phase. But if one uh, mirror uh, moves uh, in, uh, in, uh, in uh, counter phase respect to the other, then you see, so if a gravitational wave arrives, uh, you see that uh, the interference changes uh, and there is a positive interference. And this is a very sensitive method to see if the two mirrors moved. So to see if the gravitational waves arrived. So this is uh, the laser interferometer. is a Mackensen interferometer, which was, uh, um, mm, of course, uh, uh, perfectionated uh, during the years. Uh, there are several sources of noise, of course. Uh, one at low frequency. In the low frequency band, uh, this is the amplitude that you can detect, uh, and this is the frequency of the wave. In the low frequency part, uh, you are dominated by seismic noise, 
we have to reduce seismic noise, of course, suspending the detector very well with uh, mechanical filters. In the intermediate region, you have the thermal movement of the wires and of the mirror, and in the upper part, uh, you have the shot noise due to the counting of the photons of, of the laser. So there are several interferometers like that in the world. Three of them are working, I mean the two LIGO detectors and Virgo. They take uh, mm, data together. First LIGO, which was funded uh, two years before LIGO, Virgo, so first LIGO and then also, uh, also Virgo. Then there is a smaller one in Germany and there is a new project in, uh, in Japan which will take data in a couple of years. So the real, uh, the real laser interferometer is more complicated than uh, that I showed you before. I mean, the laser go, the light go back and forth uh, in, uh, in circulating uh, uh, power cavity, and there are a lot of tricks. Uh, but uh, what is important is to understand that there are these three systems uh, in uh, of uh, up advanced detectors in the world: uh, two LIGO in the US uh, and uh, Virgo in Kashina which is funded by NFN and CNRS mainly, but is now a full international collaboration with also other countries uh, in it. So to go at the sensitivity able to detect gravitational waves was a long work, a long, a long, uh, a long effort. Uh, and you need uh, to have uh, better seismic isolation, you need to have better text masses, uh, perfect mirrors, uh, suspension made uh, by low dissipation material, high power laser with low, very low noise. Uh, so at the end, uh, we succeeded. And uh, the LIGO video collaboration, thanks to the two LIGO detectors on September 14, 2015, the Hanford site and the Livingston site, uh, this is the, the noise uh, of uh, one interferometer, this part. This is the noise of the other in blue. But uh, we see at a certain moment, this noise became the shape of a wave. And it's the same. Uh, if, you if you subtract the noise, you see that the same waveform was seen by both uh, interferometers. So the interpretation, the, the, the sound that we received, uh, was that uh, we understood that it was uh, a solar one uh, solar mass one uh, black hole of 36 solar masses the other of 29 solar masses uh, spiraling together and then merging we know they were black holes because because the, these two big masses uh, have rotated at 150 hertz one around the other before merging if they were larger objects uh, with the same mass they have merged much before to to, to stars, uh, they don't arrive at this frequency. They merge much, much before. To arrive to, to, to this frequency, you, they need to be almost point-like uh, objects. And at the moment of the merging, the speed was more than half the speed of light. So we have uh, the habit to, to, to think about particles going to the speed of light almost in accelerators, but these are to astronomical objects. So what happened uh, was, uh, again, the two, s the two black holes uh, spiraled together. This uh, yellow part, the green part, is the crest of the wave, propagated uh, in, in, in space uh, for 1 billion, 300 million years. This is the distance. Arriving on the Earth uh, on September 14. Also the Earth uh, reacted to the gravitational waves. Uh, now, what you see here is uh, very exaggerated, per fortuna, but uh, this is to show that also the Earth uh, reacted to the gravitational waves. This time, the, on the Earth, there were detectors able to, sensitive enough uh, to detect gravitational waves. So this uh, changed uh, our field, of course, uh, because uh, after that, uh, there was uh, the, the, the paper of the discovery, this discovery uh, gave the Nobel Prize recently to this three person, Ray Weiss, Barry Barish, Kip Thorne, let's say the fathers of the LIGO collaboration. Um, this was, uh, uh, this is to show the black hole's dimension in solar masses uh, 
of the big events, the first one, then uh, also of the other. But after that one, we saw others uh, coalescing black holes. Uh, and this is, you see, very large masses. These are the masses uh, which were supposed to be black holes uh, due to the accretion of, uh, uh, of mass from a normal star to some, something very small which was uh, supposed to be a black hole. And we, we, we knew that because of the X-rays uh, coming from this region, so an indirect way to understand this was a black hole. But the masses uh, of the black holes which were supposed to be are a smaller, you see, of the masses uh, which we have seen with the gravitational waves. And uh, this year, on uh, August 14, also Virgo was uh, finally taking data together with LIGO and happened a new merging of two black holes in a larger one. So this time, you see, the localization in the sky is quite difficult with, with the two detectors because uh, they, 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 you, can, you, can, you can say where is the source uh, just looking to the time delay of the arrival of the wave in the detectors. So if these are two detectors uh, and you see the maximum time delay, 10 milliseconds, then you know this, this is the direction. But uh, if there is an intermediate time, then you don't know. The, loc the locus of the point is maybe a circle in the sky and you don't know where it is. With three detectors, you can triangulate and see where is the position in the sky. In fact, uh, if uh, were only for the two LIGO, you see that uh, this is the sky map, uh, the position is, uh, is quite uh, uh, indetermined, while with the Virgo, this is more, more certain. And this is the, the gain having uh, that we have with Virgo. Finally, and uh, at the end of my talk, of course, I have to show you what happened in August 17, not in August 14. Well, we were ready with the gravitational wave detectors uh, to send alarms uh, to the astronomical telescopes. This is because if the gravitational wave arrives, uh, it arrives in some point on the sky, uh, and, and you need uh, to alarm uh, the um, gamma rays, uh, optical telescope, infrared telescope, uh, to point. Uh, of course, uh, you need to, to, to say them where to, to go, where to see. And with Virgo and uh, to LIGO now, we, we can do that, actually, because we can say gravitational waves in, in that, more or less that direction, then all the, the telescope go to see what happens there, to see what develops there. And uh, actually, this was happened in, uh, in, uh, in, in August uh, this year. This is the, the um, press conference. Uh, this is Marika Branchesi, a GSSI researcher, who was coordinating this, uh, uh, this uh, interaction between gravitational wave signals and, uh, and the electromagnetic counterpart. Let me just uh, show you uh, a, a show a slide show if I realize this okay so this time there was an electromagnetic counterpart not only gravitational waves not black holes finally was object uh, two neutron stars uh, merging and giving rise to a gamma ray burst uh, and then during the minutes hours and days after developing uh, optical signals, uh, infrared signals, uh, radio signals. <coughs> so this was really incredible because you see, we, uh, we received the gravitational waves uh, with the, the two masses in the range of neutron star masses, 1.4 solar masses. Each neutron star is uh, the sun of a supernova, is the rest of a supernova. So in a neutron star, this is compared uh, with the, the, uh, the, the, the Earth, it's a dimension of a big city, a neutron star. It's not, not a big object. So these two neutron stars, uh, of course, they give rise to gravitational waves that we have seen, a very small amplitude but long gravitational waves, uh, which this time arrived uh, together. This is the gravitational waves uh, going up in frequency, 
and this was uh, the gamma ray detector Fermi. It's a satellite in the sky. After 1.2 seconds, after the two neutron stars merged uh, following the gravitational wave signal, there was this uh, peak in gamma rays. And this gamma ray traveled together with the gravitational waves, arriving on the Earth 1.7 seconds after. Now, this was a historical, of course, event. For the first time, we had the gravitational waves and electromagnetic and magnetic waves coming from the same source. So, where was the source? Well, the Fermi detector and the Fermi and the inter gamma ray detector in the spy defined uh, very badly the, the, the position. But uh, thanks to Virgo, we know now where was the position in the sky. And the position in the sky interesting to see, because uh, the reason why Virgo was so important uh, was that uh, it did not detect the, the wave, or just a little bit. This uh, means that the wave was arriving in one of the blind spots, uh, which are very precise. <laughs> so we were able to see the region, to say the region to the, uh, to the optical telescopes, and they have individuated in one galaxy, in one precise galaxy, that something new happened in the hours after the alarm. What happened is that, you see, there was uh, a, this dot was seen optically and fading away. This is a new, a new phenomenon. S look at the, and in, uh, have, having individuated in this way the precise position, the precise position in, in the sky. So what, uh, had, uh, what was important uh, in, this, uh, in, this, uh, in this measurement uh, was that uh, we clarified two mysteries. One mystery was, uh, ga was the gamma ray burst. What is the source of gamma ray burst? Let me stop for a moment uh, this, this show. Because I want to say that uh, gamma ray burst uh, is something which is not obvious at all that can happen. I mean, they were discovered by satellites, uh, spy satellites uh, from US, uh, uh, wanting during the Cold War to see if the uh, Soviet Union made te nuclear tests on the Earth. Nuclear tests, nuclear mm, bombs, uh, they emit also gamma rays, of course gamma rays is the signature of some nuclear reactions are occurring. So uh, they saw gamma ray burst, uh, but uh, not coming from the Earth, but coming from the sky. And there was a surprise. Who construct uh, nuclear bombs uh, in, in the heavens? Uh, so it was a mystery. What, what, what is the source uh, of this gamma ray burst uh, coming here and there, coming very far from the Earth, cosmological distances? So now we know ne the two neutron stars uh, coalescing and merging, they cause the gamma ray burst. And this is, uh, when, when I say everything's clarified, I maybe are a bit exaggerating. But uh, this is it's re really is a step forward uh, in our knowledge of the universe. So and gamma um, neutron stars merging, they are the origin of most of the gamma ray bursts we know, maybe all the gamma ray bursts we know. The other mystery was uh, that in the universe uh, we have not only all the elements up to the iron that we understand are formed inside stars, uh, but we have elements heavier than irons. We have, as you know from the periodic table, we have, uh, for instance, uh, this is the iron, is, 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 there are cobalt, nickel, copper, but that there are gold, for instance, uh, platinum, there is uh, uranium. So who made, who constructs, who realizes all this? You see, Big Bang have not realized all this, but only this. And just a little bit of this. All the rest are made in stars. We thought maybe the supernova collapse uh, um, is, um, is, is able to realize not only iron, but some of the elements heavier than iron. 
But all this element heavier, much heavier, was another mystery. Now we know that the merging of two neutron stars uh, is what uh, really uh, constructs, builds uh, this uh, heavier element. We know that because of the optical telescope uh, looking to the, to, the, to the source that we know from gravitational waves uh, that are two neutron stars merging. Then we know that uh, we have seen, they have seen, all these uh, uh, characteristic uh, lines uh, of tellurium, of gold, of platinum, and, and so on. So this is uh, another mystery. It seems uh, that there is uh, such an amount of gold there, which is uh, as 10 times the mass of the Earth. So this is uh, 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 the, the what we understood uh, about uh, the, the, new, the, the new systems. So I am at the end uh, of, the, of my, uh, my conference, of my lecture just to say that uh, in history every newly opened astronomical window has found unexpected results. Starting from the uh, Jupiter's but then also in 1912 the muon was detected in cosmic rays and this was a surprise, no one uh, When the radio window was opened we have seen cosmic in the background, we have seen pulsars uh, Pulsar were thought to be to be some extraterrestrial clocks uh, giving signals, um, and then X-ray, gamma ray, as I do. So gravitational wave window is recently opened, and we have seen big black hole mergers, much more black holes than we thought before. So the question, which is now on the table, is: uh, Are there? so many black holes to explain even the dark matter and to solve another mystery. This is an open, uh, an, an open problem. So uh, Virgo and LIGO have, have planned to, re to go to better, better sensitivities. Uh, there are plans for underground uh, detectors to reduce seismic noise and, uh, and, and uh, see even other sources. Uh, there is a fantastic, uh, fascinating uh, project uh, to send an interferometer in the sky and, and look to a frequency range much, much lower and to see big, uh, for instance, supermassive black holes emerging. And finally, this is uh, the global plan of the Gravitational International Committee to have uh, a lot of physics from the present advanced detectors, uh, to have a project of an underground detector uh, much larger and to send uh, to send uh, Lisa in the sky. So we started with the notebook for Galileo, the beginning of modern astronomy, the astronomy with the electromagnetic waves, uh, and we arrived uh, to a new sense, uh, to the hearing of, uh, of the universe. So we now have uh, another messenger to tell us uh, what what uh, is uh, what is in the universe. And as Marcel Proust said, uh, the real, uh, uh, the real uh, travel is not, uh, it's not important to have uh, landscapes uh, or postal cards, uh, but to have new eyes, because then nothing will be as before. Thank you for your attention.